Good evening, everyone. I've never had really that dramatic an introduction. <laughs> you probably wanted to listen to that a little bit more. Thank you for coming out tonight for our third Neely Lecture Series for our 1920 program. And um, we're really excited to have Lauren Haley here. My name is Marianne Mavernack, and I have the privilege of being the Andrew H. and Janet Dayton Neely Dean of the University of Rochester Libraries. Um, I encourage everyone to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. It really is riveting. And um, I just heard from communications today that it's um, really got some great feedback with the surveys. Like, it's, it's really highly rated, so you wouldn't want to be left out. Following tonight's um, lecture, Lauren will engage with all of you in the ante room. Regrettably, the book that she wrote did not arrive on time for tonight. Um, I know. Um, however, we have a rep from Barnes & Noble out there, and uh, she will take orders. And the arrival of the book is imminent. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, it was ordered a couple of months ago. So anyway, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Emeritus and of English and John H. Dean, Professor Emeritus of Re Rhetoric and Poetry, Russell Peck. To many a UR student, faculty, staff, and alumnus, Professor Peck is an icon. His interests are vast, in particular his scholarship in Middle English literature, medieval aesthetics, medieval intellectual history, myth and fairy tale, and medievalism in British and American popular culture. Professor Peck has had a long and vital association with the Russell Hope Robbins Library in Rush Rees, where he conceived of, over 30 years ago, the Middle English text series and continues his editorial work, having worked with many graduate students on this project. He is an aficionado of the history of drama and the current state of drama and its performance, leading several groups to London, England on an annual basis, and he's planning the March trip as we speak. He's active in the Friends of the University of Rochester Libraries, the proceeds of which the Theatre London trip goes to the libraries right across the UR library, so we're really indebted to uh, Professor Peck. In acknowledgement of his service to the libraries over many, many years, in 2018, he was awarded the Robert F. Metzdorf Award for his meritorious service to the libraries. I'm delighted that uh, Professor Peck is here to introduce our speaker. Without further ado. Here's the book. <laughs> I carry it with me. I uh, first met Lauren Haley in the fall of 2011. She was a violist at the Eastman School of Music. Classes had scarcely begun when she appeared in my office to inquire about trips to the Stratford Festival in Canada. That inquiry led into my uh, Theatre in England seminar that was to be conducted between semesters. She had grown up in England in Surrey and loved London. We talked about the performing arts, and I was amazed not only by her enthusiasm regarding the trip, but by her insights into the interconnections between composer and script, performance, the audience, and the uniqueness of that combination from one performance to another. No two performances, no two audiences are ever the same. Each time is unique. I knew immediately that Lauren was exactly the kind of person who would make my seminar on the vitality of live theatrical performances succeed. She brought her viola with her to London, and we set up an arrangement so that she could practice in the hotel, much to the delight of the hotel manager and staff. They had escaped the doldrums of hotel life by raising turtles in an aquarium and weather permitted in the wee pond out back. But now their lives came alive with the sound of music. <laughs> Years later, I was thrilled when Lauren joined the Friends of the Library Theatre in London trip in 2018 
and then revisited the latter part of the 2019 seminar when she returned to England in search of a new bow for her viola. Uh, her energy, diversity, creativity were as dynamic as ever, maybe even more so. You see, Lauren perpetually lives several lives simultaneously, as a musician, of course, and a brilliant conversationalist, but also as a world traveler, an entrepreneur with her own thriving business in Texas, a writer, the author of her wonderful book, Kids Aren't Lazy, Developing Motivation and Talent Through Music, as well as numerous articles and radio talks. She is, by habit, both a teacher and student, with a keen interest in politics and social issues as they affect our personal lives. She explores and lives vitally in the past and in the future, as well as in the present. After our first trip to England, she returned to U of R and, looking backwards, took courses in myth and fairy tale, Arthurian literature, and my graduate seminar in medieval drama. She was still an undergraduate when she signed up for the graduate, graduate course. I wondered if she would be up to the challenge of graduate research. Her reply was, of course, I love the Middle Ages. That is to say, she is emotively involved in whatever she undertakes. And that's what made her role in the course so dynamic. I still remember her paper, Death and the TARDIS, God's Power Over Death and Transportation in the York Corpus Christi plays, a paper that surpassed even Doctor Who himself in its wit and invention. The only thing boring about Lauren is her transcript, which is filled with nothing but A's. After graduation, Lauren moved back to Texas and established her own school, the Lauren Haley Studios. She has linked that establishment to Eastman School's educational program, where Eastman proto-teachers work with Lauren in Texas as interns, a final step toward their life vocation. Here is her studio's mission statement. Lauren Haley Studios aims to inspire a lifelong affection for music in students and families, to teach technique for violin and viola in a manner that prevents injury, to encourage students to persevere through musical and academic difficulties, to demonstrate advanced repertoire and technique, and to support the achievement of the students' highest goals in musicality, theory, and history. Lauren, herself a celebrated performer, maintains a solo performance repertoire of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms to Franck, Schubert, Schumann, Tchaikovsky, and Walton. She has performed abroad in the Royal Albert Hall, the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, Chichester Cathedral, the Liverpool Philharmonic Hall, and the absolutely gorgeous Menuhin Hall in Surrey, and of course, in Hatch Recital Hall, Kilburn Hall, and Kodak Hall. Lauren's primary instruments are a 1750s violin made by Thomas Smith, luthier to King George III, 1930s violin and viola bows by Francois Lott of Paris, and a modern viola by Bertrand Lepine. It is a great honor for us to have Lauren Haley with us this afternoon. Welcome back, Lauren.
Thank you so much, Professor Peck and Dean Mavernak, for those wonderful introductions. It's an absolute honor to be here today to speak with all of you. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion at the end. Um, I'm going to start with the first question I get in any interview about the book. It's always, well, what inspired you to write Kids Aren't Lazy? Um, and so I have a little bit of a story to tell. Um, here we go. Um, one of my first students, Maria, not her real name, would come to lesson each week with her father. And in class, her father would repeat just weekly, I know Maria is smart. I know she could be talented. The problem is just that Maria is lazy. I looked at him like, Maria is six. <laughs> and we have an opportunity to build a lot of great skills here, both on the instrument and as a team working together in class. Above all, I didn't want Maria to internalize this idea that she was lazy. Um, and so I set out to write a book of strategies for busy and ambitious families like Maria's to help parents um, feel welcomed into their child's journey through music. Now, of course, I didn't want to write a book uh, telling parents how to parent. As a teacher, you never want to do that. <laughs> um, but I did want to invite them along on this journey and help them understand how powerful they could be. So when I started writing the book, I realized uh, right off the bat that the first thing I had to do was consider our perspective on talent and motivation. It is so easy to look over at another family at a recital and go, there, that kid is so talented, it's so easy for him, you know, or, oh, she is so motivated. If only my child were that motivated, we'd be really onto something. Well, I'm not sure that that perspective is helpful in developing skill in young musicians. So I figured, okay, let's redefine motivation as this little kick that you get every time you accomplish something. And of course, this little kick of joy um, spurs you on to try newer, bigger things. Um, and that's what I'll call motivation. In considering talent, I realized, you know, when I first started teaching that, um, Talent is really the sum of the current skills that you have that make learning new skills easier. So, for example, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is absolutely the most difficult piece in the violin repertoire. When a child waltzes into that first lesson and starts to learn Twinkle, there, the physical coordination alone is unbelievable because we're starting from scratch, you know? Um, I mean, the bow hold, if you know anything about violin, you know this bow hold thing is traumatizing. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, when, when the child goes on and they're, they're playing Tchaikovsky, well, that ain't so bad. They've built a significant repertoire of skills to help them carry on. So that was the first thing I realized I had to work on, you know, as, as I started to write the book. Now, when I first started teaching, um, it, it occurred to me that, you know, if I could just help my students develop their, um, their soft skills on the instrument, you know, if I could just get some good discipline and persistence and routine here, uh, we could be really fabulous musicians. Um, I very quickly realized that that mission was all wrong. <laughs> and actually, what I needed to be doing was teaching music as a vessel for higher pursuits. Um, especially when I first started teaching, um, many of my students were going to uh, go on to academic fields and music was for fun. Now, as time has gone by, my students are all gonna be violin majors. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I realized that I want my students to take something home at the end of their lesson beyond just play the C sharp. Um, music lessons have to be bigger than that. Um, Studying music is a rich source of life lessons, actually, because it creates more problems for students to solve than simpler studies do. 
Um, and music's complexity drives academic growth in that sense. Um, you know, you have attention to detail, you have creativity, you have self-direction. Let me put it this way. Einstein played the violin. <laughs> so, so I needed a way when I first started writing the book to convey this to parents that like, yes, I know you want this concerto, I know you want this competition, but we have a bigger mission here. And in the book, I came up with two-column learning. Now, um, two-column learning is the idea that when we have um, like a spe field-specific task in front of us, you know, play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, memorize the Brook Violin Concerto, um, we are really also working on developing what uh, developmental psychologists call soft skills. And um, really, they should be called critical skills because they're absolutely essential in everything else young musicians will go on to do, whether they pursue academics or business or music. Um, and so, you know, for example, when parents start working with their children on, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, we realize, okay, this is the first time we've worked one on one with a teacher. Um, you know, this this might be the first time we've ever been told to do something more than once. That could be an obstacle if you're used to getting something done the first try. Um, and we're learning respect for the instrument and teacher. And you know what I'm talking about if you've ever been in a lesson with a four-year-old. <laughs> um, so, so it became important for me to, through the book, portray that, you know, okay, we really need to always be asking ourselves, what is the bigger picture takeaway? What is our soft skill lesson? Um, for older students, this memorization of repertoire <laughs> is a tricky thing. You know, students are like, Miss Haley, why must I memorize this piece? The competition does not require me to memorize this piece. <laughs> why are you? <laughs> and I say, well, it's not that I need you to have the second movement of the Mendelssohn memorized for life. It's that when you memorize, you're also learning strategy, you're learning repetition, you're learning confidence, and I wouldn't be a great teacher of any subject if I let you get out the door without these other skills. So, um, now, in two-column learning, I should say that um, it's based on the agreement that if we want to be spectacularly good at the field-specific skills here, we must be spectacularly patient, and I really do mean spectacularly patient, <laughs> building the soft skills in column two. Um, you know, it's, it's tricky because there's a trick here in the sequence of events. Before we hear so much as one note from our students, they're going to hear a lot of persistence regarding these soft skills from us, and that's, interesting when you think that, you know, it's your child's lesson, but the, the challenge here is actually for us, the adults, the teacher in the room, and the student. Now, as I was writing my book, um, there we go, um, as I was writing my book, I started to think about, you know, all the things my students could throw at me, all the excuses, any obstacle in their path, you know, and I, I knew I wanted to write about it um, because, of course, as families strive for musical excellence, obstacles do appear in the path. We, we don't want to pretend that, you know, well, I would certainly never want to pretend that I wanted to practice every day as a child. <laughs> if I said that, I'm sure my students, you know, thinking that they do occasionally want to watch TV would quit. <laughs> um, conquering these difficulties empowers young musicians to become better versions of themselves. You know, dealing with obstacles is absolutely essential for growth. It's essential for developing resilience and perseverance. So the violin, for example, has a reputation, well-deserved, um, for being the most challenging instrument, just as long as there are no French horn players here tonight. <laughs> um, Still, at least in my opinion, and I might be a little biased, the violin is one of the most expressive and rewarding instruments, too. But the many difficulties it offers can seem so troubling and overwhelming at times that young musicians and their parents decide, music must just not be the right fit for me. Um, 
And of course, you know, some parents, even in my studio, remember similar frustrations from when they were young. And that memory influences that desire to protect their children. They say, well, maybe music is genetic and we just didn't get that gene. <laughs> um, however, um, I, you know, I, as I was working with my first students, it became clear that pulling the plug on musical study in the face of difficulties is like selling stock at an all-time low. We know as investors that that's, that's when you invest in stock, <laughs> when it's at that all-time low. Um, because if you sell it, you lock in the losses. If a child quits their studies in the face of these obstacles, they lose their musical perception, or they lose their musical potential. Um, further, quitting risks validating a young musician's perception that they should be talented at a subject before they venture into it. Um, so instead, I really do advocate that the best time to invest in a child's ability to grow is when they are struggling. Um, the key to remember is that absolutely every musician has faced challenges. So let's recognize obstacles um, for what they truly are, growth opportunities in disguise. So now that's all very you know, moving and easier said than done. Um, <laughs> um, it's one thing to notice that you, know, you, you have a challenge and tell someone to push through, and it's another thing to try to solve some of these problems. Um, in the book, I decided I should divide challenges into two categories, growth obstacles and hindrance obstacles. Um, now, growth obstacles are these wonderful assignments given to us by our teachers. You know, they spur development. And um, while they may be a challenge and sometimes overwhelming, um, these challenges are absolutely essential if you want to get anywhere in your, in your studies. Um, they're assigned with purpose from our teachers. You know, they're not out of left field whether you can handle it or not. You know, um, each new challenge is slightly bigger than the last one. Of course, they're essential for development too. Now, hindrance obstacles, on the other hand, this is where teachers, parents, and administrators can really come in handy. Um, hindrance obstacles stall personal or technical development. Um, they're often accidental matters of circumstance that hit members of a class uh, unevenly. Um, and they can be resolved by adults and administrators. And you know, the main thing about hindrance obstacles is you know, when you recognize that this is truly the trouble, um, you've now set up a path for solving it. And so I'll give everybody an example. Um, a few years ago, I let a student off the waiting list and into the studio, and um, it was kind of short notice, and you know, her dad called back to say that she wouldn't be bringing her instrument to lesson that day because she had left it at school. And of course, he wanted to know if, if you know, the spot they'd been waiting for would still be theirs because she had left her instrument at school. I mean, what does that say about this child? Um, <laughs> and um, I said, yes, but you know, you're still coming to lesson today and we're gonna talk. Um, and um, when she did bring her instrument to, to, to class, I saw immediately why she had left it to school. For context, this was August in Houston. It was 100 degrees. And the shop had given her a way oversized case. They had given her a viola case instead of a violin case. And it was one of those student plastic cases that you can you know, knock on like this. Um, and you know, to tell you the truth, I would have left it at home too, um, especially if I had a backpack on a big campus. Um, and this was an easy hindrance obstacle to fix because we simply went to the shop and exchanged the case for no charge. They had just run out of properly sized violin cases for my student when she originally got her instrument. So, you know, sometimes with these hindrance obstacles, as teachers, as administrators, as parents, we can step in and say, you know what? This is a very distracting situation. I think uh, we should keep our focus, you know, where it needs to be. Um, now, I should say that this doesn't apply to all hindrance obstacles. And of course, like I mentioned, the unfairness about hindrance obstacles is that it does not strike all of our students evenly. Um, and that's where I ask parents, teachers, and students to further examine hindrance obstacles and separate them into two categories, fixable and manageable. So 
For example, I might not be able to fix the fact that it is very snowy in Rochester, but I could have a snow brush in my car. <laughs> and um, this is important too. I think, um, you know, everybody in the world has had a teacher that they didn't connect with. And sometimes you gotta say like, okay, I know you swear up and down that your math teacher doesn't like you, but we cannot change your schedule. So since we can't fix this, let's manage this. Let's see how can we still succeed in this subject? Who else can we partner with? Are there worksheets available to us? Um, just making a plan to manage these hindrance obstacles can go a long way into giving some of the power back to students um, as they um, direct their studies. So now, I do have on that note a little bit of a story that is not in the book, um, but that I tell my own students to mitigate the perceptions that they and their families maintain about how I must have been surely the perfect musical child. I, you know, <laughs> parents come into lesson and they listen to me play and they're like, darling, why can't you play like that? And, well, um, <laughs> I think it can be pivotal to know as a young musician that your mentors struggled too. Um, so when I applied to Eastman, I auditioned to pursue a degree in viola performance. Up until that point, I had played violin, viola, and piano pretty equally, and um, I had a wonderful viola teacher in London, and I absolutely loved the Walton Concerto and the Arpeggioni Sonata, and I applied to major in viola performance. Um, shortly after arriving here in the middle of the freshman year, though, I was in the practice rooms, and it, there was just always a violinist in the next room over refining the Tchaikovsky Concerto. <laughs> Um, and I realized I just absolutely had to major in violin. Now, of course, um, if, if you've you know, been over at Eastman, you know that switching from violin to viola or viola to violin, that is like switching from the NFL to the NHL. It's like, yeah, I know you play football, but can you do it on ice? Um, <laughs> and so, of course, everyone thought this was an absolutely crazy idea. Um, one administrative assistant uh, summed it up quite well. She looked at me and she goes, we don't have a form for that. <laughs> As if that would be the end of it. Um, you know, but I knew that this must be possible. Um, but, you know, Eastman is a very prestigious music school and f physical skill on an instrument is incredibly specific. There was absolutely no guarantee that I could play the violin well enough to survive at Eastman, let alone graduate. Um, and of course, you know, if you know viola, you know all the stereotypes about viola. You know, it's the violin's slower cousin. I hope my viola students aren't watching this. Um, <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it, it plays the supportive role, you know, in the orchestra. And um, so it was, it was decided that to switch majors, I would need to re-audition for Eastman in February, along with all of the other incoming freshmen, um, and, and get in again. Um, <laughs> this story has a happy ending. I finally did get to study the Tchaikovsky Concerto at Eastman with Ola Krisa, and I did graduate with my degree in violin performance on time after four years. Now, when my brother, Nathan, a cellist, relayed this story to Frank Wong, then um, a faculty at Eastman and the Ying Quartet, now the concert minister of the New York Philharmonic, Frank replied, she went the other way? <laughs> because it's common for violinists to pick up the viola, not so much the other way around. Um, in fact, Frank's own teacher back in Houston, Fidel Lack, had played a pivotal role in helping me um, get up to par on the violin. Um, to this day, the dedication of Ms. Lack and the other teachers who helped me at this tremendously challenging time in my life, um, Dr. Donna Fox, Adrian Caravan, Zvi Zeitlin, um, inspires me as I work with my own students. Here is the takeaway. As teachers, we are sometimes tasked with helping our students go the other way. <laughs> now, 
this is all fine. Many parents, though, are most interested in what to do uh, when um, practice at home is uh, not happening. <laughs> um, the first thing I tell them is that routines rule. Um, for a child to stand out musically, music must stand out on that child's list of priorities. However, let's be real, none of us are getting any less busy, and fourth grade is certainly not going to be much more difficult than seventh grade. Um, and so we have to find a way to work this system. So the first bit of advice I give to parents is that we need to find a way to create a habit out of practice. Because if we simply tell children to practice, it's going to get real old real quick. Telling a child to practice every single day is about as effective as telling your cat to please use the litter box. It may or may not happen, but your words won't have nearly as much effect as you'd hoped. <laughs> um, so a big part of the book is about developing practice routines so that, like I said, you don't have to tell your child to practice. Now, when families join my studio, everybody's very excited, very noble. They really insist, starting that first night, that they're going to go home and practice every day at 5 o'clock for an hour together. 5 p.m., I should say. Now, I know that this does not work. I'm very familiar with 5 p.m. And I know for a fact that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you have lab, yeah? And on Wednesdays, you're preparing for Thursday's math test. And then on Friday, you have Girl Scouts. And those things are all at 5 PM. And so practicing in the evening, it's absolutely impossible to get any momentum on your side. And music being a physical thing, if you skip days, <laughs> it comes back to bite you. <laughs> so I am a huge advocate for practicing in the morning before school. Now. Parents, when I first mention morning practice, all of that motivation, willpower, and enthusiasm very quickly dies. <laughs> Have you ever been awake in the morning? Do you know what happens as we try to get ready for school? Um, yes, <laughs> I have, and I have a solution for that. Um, the most important thing to my students in terms of setting up a practice routine is that we start unbelievably slow. There is no crash diet practicing here. Um, I ask them to simply just don't set your alarm any earlier. Just take the violin out of the case every morning before school. Just agree that, OK, at you know 6.53 AM, we are going to meet in the living room. We're going to unpack. And then, sure, go ahead, pack up, go to school. <laughs> now, People often find this very unsatisfying. But like once we're practicing, shouldn't we set our alarm earlier? Shouldn't we do more? Like, no, I just want every day this routine. I just want the instrument to come out of the case. And then once you're really secure with that, nothing dislodges that, you know, sure, practice five minutes. A few weeks later, practice 10. The key is we have to go so slowly in building this routine that absolutely nothing can dislodge our momentum. We don't want the routine to be such a burden before we're strong at it that we find reasons to not practice. So for example, um, obviously I'm a big fan of academics, but I do expect my students to practice the morning of the SAT. <laughs> um, and if we start this routine and um, dip our toes in and go slowly and understand how good we can feel about practicing in the morning, it's much more likely to hang on through these challenges. Um, my students tell me that their practice routine brings them comfort whenever there's something else amiss in their lives. Um, parents tell me that they love nothing more than when their student the morning before school is like, OK, let's go practice now. Um, you know, you feel like you are that adult who practiced in the morning, before school, violin with your child. I mean, what a feeling to take with you into your morning meetings. I mean, wouldn't you just feel so smug and superior? <laughs> I mean, I think it would help everybody make better decisions from the rest of the day because you've started off on such a brilliant note. So. This became a big anchor in, in the book, is, is working on these routines. OK, now, the next thing that parents ask me um, as, as we work together is like, so how do I make them love violin? You know, how do I make them really interested in it? You know, 
um, they'll, they'll be kind of like, you know, so she really listens to a lot of Britney Spears, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and they say that, like it's a bad thing, you know? But they want to know how do we get students to, to march into the practice room and be motivated and, you know, how do you help a student fall in love with the Sassons Concerto? Um, I have a thought on this, of course. Um, you might recognize Carnegie Hall in this slide. Um, and the pianist here is my studio pianist, Evelyn Lamb. She's currently a doctoral candidate in piano performance at Eastman. And Evelyn flies to Houston every few months um, to work with my students for a recital. And of course, when my students first hear about the soon-to-be Dr. Lamb, they're very scared. <laughs> um, and then they meet her and absolutely fall in love. More importantly, though, they see her level of performance and her kindness. And seeing Evelyn helps them envision that they, too, could come to Eastman. They, too, could pursue performance. They, too, can be expressive on stage and be brave on stage and proud of their work. So I ask my studio families to look for as many Evelyns as they can possibly find. And they don't necessarily have to be piano Evelyns. Um, I think it's important to go to community concerts. It's important to go to youth concerts. Um, it's incredible to show students that there's more than one way to make art, and there's more than one way to be brave and expressive on stage. When we enthusiastically show up to a Beatles tribute concert, even though we really prefer Shostakovich, um, we show students that um, art from all people and all genres should be respected. And we show them that um, that these paths are available to them too someday. Now, this doesn't have to be limited to just youth orchestra concerts and high school productions. Um, I've found that absolutely every artistic experience is a chance to fall in love with a new idea. Um, each time a child encounters a new form of art, including music, they learn to respect the work of others, even if it's not to their own taste. Um, you know, have you ever noticed how creative people always seem to have room for one more passion? Um, you know, with free admission to, um, well, the University of Rochester's everything, um, many fine art museums, youth orchestra concerts, library lectures, local art festivals, a well-rounded arts education doesn't have to be expensive, contrary to the belief, though, of many, many parents. Um, you know, let's really focus as educators on helping our students see our enthusiasm for live performances um, because one day our students will be the artists provoking these reactions from the audience members. You know, we want to show students that they can take something of value from every work presented to them. Now, there's, there's a trap here. Um, if we dismiss any form of art as too immature, you know, stop watching those cartoons, too highfalutin, oh, I just, I don't understand Bach. Um, <laughs> or too simple, I could have painted that myself, <laughs> you know? Um, we teach young minds that certain types of art are of greater inherent value than others. We place artificial limits on the enjoyment of works. And we put our students into a certain cultural box. By seeking diverse sources of inspiration, we give our students the chance to be well-rounded artists. So, you know, uh, a few years ago, I was at um, a museum in Houston with a family friend, um, Joanne Brown, who's here tonight. And she was looking at the pieces, and, and she remarked that art binds us together it shows how people have always felt compelled to create meaningful work, regardless of their location, culture, or century. And so, curiosity about, tolerance for, and acceptance of new ideas, sounds, and experiences are key success factors in young artists. 
So we really should demonstrate that no one form of art is inherently superior. Now, you get an added bonus when you convey this to young musicians. When you show that regardless of age, genre, or level, honest artistic work deserves respect, you develop bravery in your students and children. So if, as a parent, you have long kept and treasured a homemade popsicle Christmas ornament, you're on the right track. <laughs> I should say that uh, you'll notice that poster there. Um, that is a, a hand-drawn chalk sign at the Sam Wanamaker Theater in London from the 2018 um, Friends of the University of Rochester Libraries trip to London led by the PEX. Um, the music that you heard at the beginning of class today of the beginning of the lecture today. Class is such a habit. Um, <laughs> uh, the music that you heard at the beginning of the lecture today is, um, is from that production. It was um, The Four Seasons Recomposed by Max Richter, um, a fabulous composer. Um, my brother, um, who was studying econometrics at the time, was fortunate enough to work with at Princeton. Now, so moving on. So we've talked about you know, how to develop these routines and the obstacles, and most importantly, we've talked about inspiration. How do we actually practice together? So if you've ever tried to practice a musical instrument with someone you're related to, <laughs> you know that it is so much easier said than done. Um, parents remark that when they bring their Children to lesson with a stranger, their child is so much more cooperative for this stranger. Um, <laughs> and so I'd like to talk a little bit about the recipe for, um, for positive practice. Um, to start, um, the fundamental principle of a child's motivation to practice is the belief that something good will come from their work. And actually, come to think of it, isn't that why we do anything. <laughs> so if a, young fam if a young child is worried about um, their family hearing them practice and any comments that would come from that, they're not going to practice. <laughs> um, so it, you know, the establishment of that faith that something good will come of this if I keep going has to start with parents and teachers. So um, to begin, I'm a really big fan of using guiding questions to teach. Now, um, when, when parents come to my lesson, you know, their worst nightmare is me saying like, okay, so now you're gonna learn this piece too. Um, <laughs> and I assure them that they, they don't have to play the violin and they don't have to know every measure of their child's piece. All I ask is that instead of shouting from the kitchen, sweetie, make it perfect, something's wrong there, <laughs> um, or shouting, uh, you know, you should just keep practicing, it'll sort itself out. You know, I just ask that parents um, have a set of questions from the teacher each week to in turn ask their students. What I've found is that my students often know the answer to a musical difficulty. They just need someone to ask the question. So for example, I'm a really big fan of how Dorothy DeLay would ask her students, Sugar Plum, what do you think of this F sharp? And I found that when I channel Dorothy DeLay, my students always know what to think of this F sharp. <laughs> so um, I do ask parents to come to absolutely every lesson, and I do ask them to take notes, just so that when they're at home, they're able to model for their students this learning process to sort out, you know, when you get stuck on something, what do you do next? So guiding questions is the biggest way to do that without having to actually be an expert on Beethoven's Spring Sonata yourself. <laughs> um, and it's good too because even with musicians who are four and five years old, um, they get very excited to tell you exactly what they think. <laughs> and they take pride in it. So the next thing I tell parents about practicing is to agree on a practice code. Now, if you look very closely here, you see um, a cutout teddy bear that says Good Tone Highway. 
I'll have you know that teddy bear is from 1995. <laughs> um, somewhere along the way, my dad realized that you know he was going to have to tell me about my bull hold thousands of times. And no matter how patient you are, it's hard to listen to someone tell you to fix something thousands of times and still feel like you're a good child. It's also really hard to tell someone to fix something thousands of times. Um, and so he thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to take the easy way out. I am going to make a sign. Instead of talking over you when you play, I am just going to hold up this little teddy bear. And I can only imagine several other animals. Um, my students use this too. Um, their parents sit on the couch doing work or whatever and just occasionally hold up signs that just remind students to go on the right track. This is the practice room equivalent of what Zvi Zeitlin would do when I was at Eastman wander the practice rooms and ask anybody who was playing through their piece if they would please come for an extra lesson. Um, <laughs> um, so, but this works quite well because what I've found is that students are very often task oriented. They want to finish the page. Teachers and parents, we're often quality oriented. We want young musicians to go back and play those two notes over and over and strategize. How could I play it better? Um, and so agreeing on a practice code allows us, the adults, to keep practice sessions on track without having to be overly involved. <laughs> so, um, so yes, that is vintage teddy bear helping us to this day. Um, now, it has to be said, though, um, this all sounds you know, wonderfully positive, <laughs> but we know that musical performance benefits from the relentless pursuit of ever higher standards. As adults, we know that receiving constructive feedback is absolutely crucial to success in any professional career. Um, Similarly, we recognize that when we provide guidance through a child's practice sessions, you know, we help them develop persistence, reflection, and self-direction. However, delivering constructive criticism to advance musical technique is neither intuitive nor easy, even if you aren't related to the person you're working with. Um, however, we can advance our ability to provide this guidance. It starts with nuanced attention to the well-being of the parent-child and teacher-child relationship every step of the way. Um, providing appropriate feedback, even in the most difficult moments, is an investment in a child's learning skills and also in their future ability to accept meaningful critique. And we really want young people to be able to accept meaningful critique if they're going to be an expert at anything. Um, effective criticism, at its heart, is about empowering children to build learning processes. So when you demonstrate how to approach a musical or a technical obstacle, you teach that young musician how to reflect on their playing, but also how to tackle future challenges outside the study of music. Um, so I ask parents to question, you know, how do I want my children to judge their work when they're older? Is it OK if they're sweeping vague or negative? Is it effective? Or do I want to show them how to be picky, persistent, and positive? I emphasize positive because I've found that you can have much higher standards if they're delivered in a positive way than you can if they're delivered in, you know, a negative way. <laughs> now, um, uh, this next little bit, if you listen to WXXI today, you heard them choose this. Um, appropriate criticism empowers young musicians. Um, positive critique builds new structures onto existing efforts. Destructive critique tears down what has already been built. You know, where proper guidance builds skills, ineffective criticism at its, at its, at its best it just maintains the status quo. And it, at its worst, it, it damages a young child's belief in their own potential. Um, when I think back to my favorite lessons, those are lessons where my teachers 
gave me tools for reflecting on my practicing. And to this day, I still think to myself, what would they say about this particular obstacle? You know? And that's really what we're trying to establish here. Um, when we critique someone, we're giving them suggestions to build something better. And that's the difference between criticism that can build your self-esteem and criticism that can destroy what you've already built. Now, once again, this is easier said than done. <laughs> this is called Miss <Mess> City. <laughs> um, this is the floor of my apartment when I was working on Kids Aren't Lazy. Um, as you can see, I would write little ideas from lessons on index cards, and um, every so often I would arrange them on the floor in order of, you know, it, it just made it so much easier than scrolling in a Word document when you were trying to develop an outline for a book. The outline was very important to me because I knew that parents are busy, and if my book was disorganized, nobody would have the time for it. So I would stack up all these index cards, put them in order, um, when it got too much for the floor, I would put the index cards in plastic bags, which would then be labeled and filed in order into the little boxes at the top there, which became the chapters. <laughs> um, I called it Mess City because anybody could look at this and go, <laughs> that is written in pink gel pen. <laughs> How far do you think this book is going to go? <laughs> um, especially, uh, I mean, even, even the dog had his doubts. Um, <laughs> that's Winnie. Um, <laughs> so um, I called the floor Mess City, and here's why. A neighborhood under construction is always a mess, no matter how organized your construction crews are. You know, this is just part of the process. The temporary aesthetics do not match the anticipated results. When I first started writing Kids Aren't Lady Lazy, of course, I received two types of feedback. Um, the first type, the very boring type, was encouragement. <laughs> you know, like my mentors would say, this is a great project, and I mean, they'd acknowledge the difficulty and the magnitude of the task, but then, you know, they'd say, okay, but you're on the right path, keep going. Um, the far more interesting type was discouragement. Uh, I heard from several people, parents don't read, which is not entirely true. Um, and of course, the famous, wouldn't your time be better spent, you know, practicing? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, in the process, I realized that as educators and leaders, we're tasked with supporting work in its earliest, messiest stages. And this is way easier said than done, because to be honest, Mess City looks an awful lot like just plain old mediocrity, you know? Um, and that's just because a draft is never as good as a final product. And some drafts are just downright bad. Um, there's a fundamental difference, though, between mediocrity and Mess City. Mediocrity means a project has ceased to improve. Um, mess city means that you're on to something, you're just at the beginning, and I hate to say it, but you have to go through this. Y you know, you can't fault the cake for needing 25 minutes to bake in the oven. And if you take it out too soon, well, good luck with that cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we do have to see massive potential in our work in our early stages because it allows us to critique it. The more we decide that we like the possibilities here, the more we are willing to put up with as we <laughs> just barrel through the absolute difficulties that uh, writing a book throws at you. <laughs> um, I think it's also important um, for young musicians to recognize that the way we experience final products, you know, perfectly clean new house. A violin concerto performed straight through with the orchestra a book without a single typo or superfluous phrase, um, that this bears little resemblance to the detailed, precise, and sometimes downright repetitive work it took to create. Um, to me, teaching well means helping students engage with their pickiest, most persistent selves to create the best possible work, you know? I formally apologize to my Roomba. <laughs> now, 
Um, when I was living in London, I had a violin teacher uh, and viola teacher named Levine Andrade, and he had a wonderful way of dealing with this this phase. Uh, as I learned, um, as I was learning the Walton Viola Concerto for my Eastman audition, he would call out, "That's very nearly very very good." And at first, I kind of looked at him like, "Okay, so is it?" Is it good? Can I stop? Is it, you know, very nearly good? Is it very, very good? I mean, I just I didn't know what he meant. And what he meant was, even though we weren't ready yet, we weren't going to stop. We believed in this thing together. We weren't going to stop. And he was going to keep going with me because in the end, it would be very, very good. And I think that's so important, you know? Um, Levine um, really embraced this stage. He was actually he was a musical entrepreneur. He was the founder of the London Telephonic, um, and he's the one who gave me the chance to play in all these famous halls and angel recording studios in England. Um, he knew that you can recognize the quality of a piece that's still in its working stages, and he taught players how to believe in a project right from the start. I think this is a defining characteristic of effective teachers and entrepreneurs. You know, they're people who buy stock in Microsoft when it's 50 cents. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think um, it's important to defeat the debilitating effects of perfectionism in young musicians. Um, that is to say, you know, an intolerance for anything in the early stages. Because if you can't tolerate the early stages of something, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, we should teach young musicians to embrace optimism, hope, and the perpetual motivation that comes from knowing that simply believing, OK, when I keep working, improvement happens. Now, I think you guys can think of a school that's already thought of this. Um, here at the University of Rochester, um, we embrace this dedication to perpetual improvement with our motto, Meliora, which, as you've probably heard on the radio today, means ever better. Here's the thing. The spirit of Meliora demands no prerequisites. No matter how you start out, you can strive for excellence. So now, OK, this is where a lot of parents are really interested when they get to lessons. Everybody wants to win competitions. I mean. Don't you guys, too? Um, <laughs> um, so I'd like to speak a little bit briefly about this. I've found that um, there are three things um, that affect, or three factors, I should say, that um, can really boost our performance. Um, of course, we know as performers that you know, the way we play on a Friday may not at all be how we play on a Sunday. These three things are, one, adequate preparation on the musical material. I know, shocking. Um, <laughs> two, our mental state and our mental preparation. And three, our physical comfort. So I'm always harping on my students to be thinking about these three categories every time they prepare for a competition. Now, I'm going to be very brief on this because Eastman is very good at preparing you for competitions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll just say that. Um, Competitions are important because even if it takes you a while as a student to start winning competitions, these experiences in competing will help you to become a better musician. I'm always reminded of a Randy Pausch lecture. He was um, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And in his book, The Last Lecture, he said that experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And so I always tell my students, I always enter my students in competitions the minute they're age-wise they're allowed to do them. <laughs> um, and I say that, like, you know, you don't understand, we have to do a lot of these. Um, and experience is what we get when we don't get what we want. So it's very important we do the toughest competitions we can. Um, this works. This year in a competition of almost um, 400 young violinists, I had the violinist ranked number one. She's been doing a lot of competitions. <laughs> now. Um, as I a little bit wrap up here, I think it's more important to talk about subjectivity after the competition than it is to even prepare for the competition. My understanding of that of subjectivity is that when I send my students to these competitions, I don't know who the judge is going to be. 
You know, I don't know what other instruments my students are competing against. I don't know if some of those students just started lessons and others have a $40,000 violin. I do know that it's important for my students to understand that music is like sports and that sometimes you get a bad call from a ref and how you react to it and how your teachers and your family members react to it can really change your relationship with your instrument. Um, you know, there are times uh, in sports and in music to point out injustices and unfairnesses. And then there are times when we have to realize that we can't change this machine, but we do have to learn how to work it. You know, this respect, balancing, you know, a respect for the way the world turns along with an eye for, you know, inappropriate situations and competitions will keep a child's self-esteem afloat as they do navigate auditions. So um, I've found that when young musicians and their parents don't quite understand subjectivity, they perceive it as either like a bias or unfairness. Um, you know, oh, well, that judge, they, that kid only won because the judge was their teacher. You got a point there. Um, <laughs> or they perceive it as a weakness on their part. Oh, I never win and I'm never going to win. Those other kids are winners and I am not. Um, blaming the world gives children a chance to stop believing in anything. Blaming themselves paralyzes future efforts. You know, it creates a feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, Many of my young students don't yet have the maturity to understand subjectivity. As adults, we too sometimes fall short in understanding this phenomenon. I mean, haven't you ever shouted at a ref? You know? <laughs> Am I asking the right room that question? <laughs> um, however, I think one of the advantages of doing competitions is that it gives you the opportunity to communicate to students about subjectivity. Our job is not to rage against a loss. Oh, that judge was incompetent. He can't even play Twinkle himself. Um, <laughs> um, but to communicate these difficulties to, to young musicians in a way that never causes them to question their self-worth. You know, uh, the world is not fair. You know, competitions, applications, judging, even judging works of art or bottles of wine against each other is incredibly subjective. And so, we have to understand this, especially if we are the teachers sending a violinist to compete against a cellist, against a bassoon player, all judged by a French horn player. So, um, yeah. Okay, so moving on. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, if you can see here, I know it's a little dark. Um, that's my father playing French horn, and that's my mother playing piano. Um, they didn't know <laughs> that this photo was being taken. It was taken by um, my soon-to-be sister-in-law. She's a self-described Swiss Army knife of the creative arts. Um, and I think it's important because both in her photos, which you've been looking at this whole time, by the way, her name is Albertine Wong, um, both in her photos and in the actions of my parents just playing music as amateurs for fun, you really get a window into heartfelt creativity. Heartfelt creativity is what I hope to leave my students with. It is the defiance of self-doubt in the pursuit of bringing music, art, and ideas into the world. To champion heartfelt creativity in our homes and classrooms, let's cheer on the critical thinking skills that lead to self-directed progress. Let's look for chances to connect with others through art, whether that art is familiar or completely new to us. Um, let's also show the value of learning the rules present in any discipline. We build on that field-specific knowledge by teaching the complementary skills of thinking outside the box. Um, we inspire young musicians to call on their own experiences and bring new ideas into existence. That TARDIS paper <laughs> happened when my roommate was a very big Doctor Who fan as I was trying to write it. <laughs> um, I think it's important to know that, you know, for the parents in the room, no person, regardless of credentials, is more innately talented than your child. 
your child has the only thing that truly matters in their pursuit of motivation and talent, and that's you, the parent. Um, as the parent, you're the most important teacher they'll ever have. No Beethoven, Einstein, or Picasso could teach them any better than you could. Every technique, every note, every essay, every science project is an opportunity for the two of you to develop meaningful learning skills that will guide your child through life's adventures. Now, my last slide is my absolute favorite family photo. It's taken by our family friend Joanne Brown, who I said is here tonight. Um, and it shows, of course, my parents, um, myself, I'm the one in head to toe pink, um, and my brother. Um, we're practicing at home together in the mid 90s. In it, my mother sits at the piano while my father holds his own cello procured to help my brother. Um, like my brother's, it has bright yellow tapes all over the fingerboard. Um, I must say, my bow hold looks good, but one sock is halfway off. Um, <laughs> whenever I hear families wonder aloud if they have what it takes to develop musical motivation and talent, I show them that photo to illustrate how my musical journey started, just like theirs. Yeah. <laughs>